Well, what a privilege today to have Andrew Dow with us. Um, I know little about him. Uh, I only met him a few weeks ago, but what he has to share with us absolutely fascinates me. So, Andrew, welcome. It's good to have you. Let me just ask, where are you speaking from? Um, I'm speaking from my home in Morton in Marsh in Gloucestershire, Cotswold country. The very beautiful Cotswolds. That's that's wonderful. And let me ask you, what do you do for a living? <laughs> well, I'm retired, um, but I have been a Church of England uh, minister, vicar uh, since 1971. So that's 51 years now. Wow. And, and, and where did you minister? Oh, right. Well, um, I was a vicar in Leamington Spa, in Solihull near Birmingham, then Christchurch, Clifton, Bristol, and finally in Cheltenham uh, before retirement part A. <laughs> well, that's tremendous. Uh, and very briefly, Andrew, how was it you yourself became a Christian? Well, I didn't grow up in a Christian home. Um, my parents were kind of nominal Church of Scotland, but they threw it all over when they came south over the border. It's the mm. kind of corrupting influence of the English, you know. Um, right. Uh, but I got involved with a local boys Bible class um, and loved it because they organised outings to steam locomotive sheds and sport and that kind of thing. But over the years, age nine to 11, I heard consistently on a Sunday afternoon uh, Bible stories and Bible verses explained so well by, by a lovely, gifted, godly Christian leader. Um, and that led me to go on to, to a, a camp in 1957. Uh, and I could just say a wee bit more about that if you wanted me to. Yes, please tell us what happened. I'm, I'm a, a great believer in Christian camps for young people. So, yes, please tell us. Well, it was uh, the camp was wonderful. Again, lots of fabulous activities. Every night there was a meeting. We had singing and a talk and so on. And on the last night, the speaker stood up and said, now, look, he said, it's no good just believing in your head all these things about Jesus. Um, you have to open the door of your life to him. And I'm pretty certain he showed a picture, the same picture we're going to look at, Holman Hunt's mm. part of the world, and explained that Jesus was knocking. It was necessary to draw back the bolts, so to speak, and let him in. And as an 11-year-old, I just took a very simple step and did that. And it went on through quite a lot of ups and downs from there. Wonderful. Wonderful. Well, it's very, very good to have you with us. Of course, this must be one of uh, England's most famous pictures. I've seen it with my very eyes in, in London, but uh, you're going to talk us through it and tell us about William Holman Hunt, as we call him, uh, and the picture. Andrew, it's great to have you. Thank you for joining us. Really, over to you. Thank you for your welcome. Uh, let's go, shall we? We've mm. got a picture of the uh, painting right here, uh, but we can move on to the next one, I think, now. The next image. Yes, there we go. Okay. Now, <clears throat> William Holman Hunt was born in 1827. He became one of three young Royal Academy artists who, banding together, founded what would be called the Pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood, or PRB. The other two were Dante Rossetti and John Everett Millet, and the group eventually grew to seven in number. In 1853, when just 26 years old, Hunt painted what came to be called The Light of the World, and he first exhibited it a year later in 1854. And it caused a sensation in both the religious and artistic establishments. Uh, some people raved about it. So John Ruskin, the well-known English writer and art critic, described Hunt's work as one of the noblest works of sacred art ever produced in this or any age. But one of Ruskin's contemporaries, the Scottish essayist and historian Thomas Carlyle, he described the painting as a poor mistaken presentation of the noblest and most heroic minded being that has ever walked God's earth. We'll come back to that later on. Well, Despite trenchant criticism like that, the next 20 years saw photographs and engravings of the light of the world achieving vast circulation, while the original was bought by Thomas Kuhn of Oxford University Press. On his death in 1872, the painting was offered to Keeble College, Oxford, and in 1892 was displayed in the college chapel, where it can be viewed today. Some years later, Hunt was beginning to lose his eyesight, 
So he decided to paint a second version, at least twice as big as the original. It was sold on the understanding that the buyer would send it round the world as a teaching visual aid of the Christian faith. It was also requested of the buyer that he had colour reproductions made that could be sold quite cheaply. And as we know, these have been made and sold ever since. So at the turn of the last century, this second version went on a world tour. And believe it or not, it travelled thousands of miles to Canada, South Africa, Australia and New Zealand. And in those last two countries, it's estimated that 80% of the population saw it. Many of the viewers travelling hundreds of miles to have a look. So for many, it became, as someone had put it, a sermon in a frame and a profoundly moving sermon at that. Finally, in 1904, the painting was hung in St Paul's Cathedral in London, where it can still be seen today. At the service that took place there, uh, to mark the event, Hunt, now old and almost blind, had to be led out of the cathedral in tears. So why did he paint it in the first place? Well, he was brought up in a devout church family, but as a teenager, he drifted away from institutional religion into a kind of adolescent agnosticism. But his mid-twenties found him moving again, moving apart from that adolescent agnosticism. He was on some kind of spiritual journey. And this is what he wrote at the time. Youth offered me bribes, but I myself had been much in want of some certainty as to whether there was indeed a master who cared for aspirations in us, higher than the attempt to find happiness in our short life. And he went on to say this, I painted the picture with what I thought, unworthy though I was, to be by divine command, and not simply as a good subject. So, to use his own words, does the painting suggest that Hunt had discovered something of the divine master he was searching for. And can we discover someone, someone with a capital S, someone divine, who will meet our deepest needs and fulfil our profoundest longings? Let's begin to look at the light of the world in some detail. The painting is based on two verses from the New Testament, and here's the first. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Now, Jesus said this during his earthly three-year ministry in Palestine. He spoke this to Jewish crowds in Galilee. But based on his understanding of the Bible, Holman Hunt clearly believed that this claim of Jesus did not die with him on his cross of execution. Far from it. Christ's resurrection that followed his death catapults this claim into a universal and eternal application. The light of the world for all time and to all peoples. It is, if you think about it, a staggering claim for anyone to make. To claim to be the provider to the whole world of the light of life. None of the so-called holy men and women of history, St. Paul, Muhammad, Gandhi, Mother Teresa, Guru Nanak, the Dalai Lama, none of them have ever dared to make a claim anything like this. And so we're faced really with just three options. Perhaps, perhaps Jesus was mad, utterly deluded, like David Icke and other sad nutcases. If not mad, perhaps... He was bad, a charlatan, a trickster, misleading thousands for personal gain. Although it has to be said that doesn't fit the evidence of his life at all. Well, if not bad or mad, we're really only left with the final option. Jesus was right. He was telling the truth. The light of the world back then and now. 
Well, to return to the picture, it's clearly the lantern there in Christ's left hand that most obviously illustrates his claim to be the light. Hunt painted by night to achieve some measure of realism, and apparently he designed his own brass lantern with a special guard, you can see it clearly, so that the candle inside could not be easily extinguished. On the one hand, the lantern is a kindly lantern, don't you think? Jesus promises those who trust in him that he will guide them, that he'll give them wisdom and reveal in advance potential pitfalls and potholes on life's path. Certainly, speaking personally, I have been hugely grateful down the years that through his words recorded in my Bible, Jesus has gently but firmly warned me of the dangers of marital unfaithfulness, grasping for money, the perils of conceit and pride and meanness of spirit, and so on and so on. Of course, I haven't always listened. I'm a work in progress as every follower of Jesus is. Anyway, a kindly lantern, a friendly torch, we might say, but also a divine searchlight, surely, capable of exposing some of the darker recesses of our hearts, which we would have preferred to be kept hidden and forgotten. The second New Testament verse on which the painting is based comes from the book of Revelation the last book of the Bible, also written by St. John. Revelation chapter 3, verse 20, and this is spoken not by the man Jesus on a hillside in Israel this time, but by Jesus the risen Christ in a vision to John. And this is what he says. Here I am, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him and he with me. The phrase eat with him there doesn't, of course, mean a literal meal. No, it's a very Middle Eastern way of describing a close relation of friendship. Well, there, sure enough, on the left of the picture is a door. And to judge by the Revelation verse, it has to be the door to an individual's life the entrance to someone's heart. The door doesn't appear very welcoming, does it? It looks neglected and uncared for. It clearly hasn't been opened for a long time. There are weeds growing at its base, throttling tendrils creeping up its length. Just two of the ways that Hunt is trying to depict in the whole image the sad and needy state of the world as he sees it, that world into which Christ has come wanting to open up his light. Other details in the picture powerfully add to this assessment. Notice, bottom right, rotting apples, an image of decay and death. And somewhere in the sky, a bit hard to pick out, but it's there, is a flitting bat, what Hunt calls a natural symbol of ignorance. And what season of the year is it? Answer, autumn. The trees in the background are losing their leaves, or it could even be early winter, with its shared association of increasing cold and darkness. Perhaps with his own youth in mind, Hunt spoke of the accumulated hindrances of sloth. So here is his perspective on the world into which Christ has come. And that world, of course, is entirely made up of people like you and me and him. And so therefore, is it actually you and me? Every human being, in fact, who are seen here as both victims of and perpetrators of willful ignorance, laziness, neglect, decay, closed minds, and death. All those things deeply affecting us behind our door, but also harming others in the world outside our door. 
You know, the Bible has one word for all this. It's a little word, but it's a big word, really. It's the word sin. And I think it's important that we understand just what Christianity has to say on this subject. Most of the world's religions, Islam is an example, view sin as the breaking of rules or regulations, law breaking. Christianity absolutely agrees with that. The breaking of the Ten Commandments, for instance. But the Christian faith goes much, much deeper than that. Because in the Bible, sin is portrayed as more of a, an inbuilt disease, a, a sort of spiritual cancer, if you'll forgive me using that term, in every one of us. A cancer which can and does break out from time to time in the deliberate or accidental breaking of God's laws in our actions, our words, and our thoughts. Someone has put it helpfully this way. In the Christian faith, sin, singular, is the root. Sins, plural, are the fruits of that root. Those of you who might be from an Anglican or Church of England background might recall the old prayer book's prayer of confession. We have done those things that we ought not to have done, and we've left undone those things we ought to have done. And then the crunch line, really, and there is no health in us. No health in us. That's the root. In her Christmas broadcast of 2011, Her Majesty the Queen expressed her Christian perspective like this. She said, Although we are capable of great acts of kindness, history teaches us that we sometimes need saving from ourselves, from our recklessness and our greed. Jesus himself shone his searchlight, his lantern, into what lies behind the door when he said this to a crowd of ordinary people just like you and me. He said, you know how to give good gifts to your children. We'll find that out at Christmas, won't we? Though you are evil. Jesus the light doesn't deny that you and I are capable of great goodness and generosity. But his diagnosis is nevertheless that we are at root evil. A poisonous evil is what lies behind the door of hearts closed against God and Jesus and hearts which, left untreated, render us completely unfit for his presence in this life or the next, and subject to God's righteous judgment. Now, that's the picture's bad news, which we had to get over first. What about the good news on this canvas? How does Jesus deal with what is behind that door and at its threshold? And the answer is in so many fabulous ways. So, looking at the whole picture again, let's think carefully about the Christ that Hunt has depicted. Is this Christ male or female? I suggest both. Hunt used two models for the painting. A woman for Christ's hair, Christina Rossetti, in fact, and a man for his facial features. One art critic has talked of the ungender of the portrait. Christianity's Christ is for everyone, a Christ who appeals to every human heart. What do you think about his eyes? Loving and compassionate? Yes, I think so. And Christina Rossetti found here what she called motherly compassion and patience. Those eyes are also lovingly searching and penetrating, aren't they? Jesus does seem to be looking straight at us, at you and me. It's difficult to avoid his gaze, the gaze of a bright light. So another question, is this Christ human or divine? Or both? One of the reasons that Thomas Carlyle disliked this painting so much is because he thought the Jesus depicted here was nothing like the wandering homeless Jesus of Nazareth 
of the four Gospels. Here's what Carlyle wrote. Do we ever suppose that Jesus walked about in priestly robes and a crown? Was he not a man toiling along in the hot sun, at times in the cold wind, tired, hungry, and often and footsore? And I want to say to him, yes, Thomas, yes, you are so right to include all that in your image of Jesus. He was graphically human and therefore able to identify fully with our human struggles. But have you forgotten the end of the story, the gospel story? Your tired and toiling man was brutally crucified, but three days later, his heavenly father God raised him from the dead, victorious over humankind's greatest enemy, death. The Easter Sunday miracle. Because God, Jesus, God in human shoes, was uniquely both human and divine. Death just couldn't keep hold of him. On our behalf, he triumphed over it, and as a consequence, has become the universal and awesomely priestly king that we see in this picture. The Christ who is alive forevermore, said Hunt. Well, so much for Carlyle's criticisms, but interestingly enough, they did prompt Hunt in later paintings to depict Jesus' humanity more clearly. Take a look, for instance, at this painting, sometimes called The Carpenter's Shop or The Shadow of Death. See the young man's rippling muscles as this Galilean artisan in the prime of life has a kind of, a kind of stretch after a hard day's toil, perhaps. Very true to life, so in the pre-Raphaelite genre. But you can't mistake what's in the background, can you? His very realistic human posture has cast a sinister cruciform shadow on the wall behind. There is death in the frame. And during his earthly ministry, Jesus clearly predicted his execution and resurrection three times at least. He once said this, he said, I've not come to be served, but to serve and to give my life as a ransom for many. Ransom, if you like, a payment, a sort of payment to pay the enormous cost of the sin of the world, the cost of your sin and my sin, which if you like has taken us ransom. So does Jesus' death on Good Friday feature in Hunt's Light of the World picture? Yes, I think it does. Let me try and show you. Look at the overall structure of the portrait. Follow me, so to speak, from the head straight down vertically to the lantern. The arrow is showing you. Then from his right arm horizontally, to the tree boughs, the wood, on his left. Is this not the outline of a cross of wood? So Jesus' death is here, but somewhat subtly maybe. Markedly less subtle is how Hunt presents to us his post-crucifixion light of the world. How, as a resurrected king-priest, a royal high priest. You can see it in his robes. By the way, Hunt used his mother's best tablecloth draped around his model. What's the traditional role of a priest? Well, it is to stand between a people and their gods, or God. And standing in the middle, so to speak, to mediate on their behalf. To reconcile a people with their God. And how does a traditional priest do that? Answer, by offering a sacrifice. An animal whose shed blood somehow atones for the people's errors, takes those errors away, soaks up the sinner's guilt. And here, well, it's incredible. This high priest offers not a substituted animal's blood, but, incredibly, his own. The blood 
of a perfect God-filled life. The blood of, yes, God himself, in fact. So we see Christ's hands still nail-pierced. And now from hands to head. The crown, the crown of blood-stained thorns. Here's a close-up. Some of you will know the Easter story as told in three of the four Gospels. Jesus has been condemned to death by Pontius Pilate, and so his cross is now being prepared by the execution squad. In the interval, some of the soldiers stationed in Pilate's headquarters plait a crown or coronet of Palestinian thorns. Vicious spikes up to 12 inches long and in a crude display of coarse thuggery, they ram it down hard on Jesus's skull, producing yet more blood. Over the last few weeks here in Britain, we've been thinking quite a lot about crowns, haven't we? And we shall be thinking more about crowns in May 2023, and especially this one. This exquisite and priceless artifact taken by the Archbishop at the Queen's coronation and gently and oh so carefully placed on the Sovereign's head. A huge symbol of her earthly authority and status. But as Archbishop Justin Wilby pointed out in his funeral address, the Queen was not crowned and did not permit anyone to pledge allegiance to her for who she was until she at the high altar had first pledged allegiance to the Lord, the King of Kings. That was the right way round. Of course, those soldiers back in Jerusalem were not pledging any kind of allegiance with their cruel crown. No, they were staging a mock coronation, humiliating and ridiculing Jesus and adding to his mental and physical torture. Now, have you ever asked yourself, what does this little detail add to the Easter story? Have you ever thought like this, that in his passion, Jesus endured, soaked up, absorbed, took upon himself almost every kind of human evil imaginable in a grotesque all-in Horrendous physical violence in the beatings and crucifixion, yes. But before that, betrayal by a close friend, Judas. Desertion by all his other friends when they ran away. Then the monstrous injustice of a show trial before a cowardly judge in Pilate. The hateful shouts of a mob baying for his blood. The mockery of the bystanders. And here, symbolised by that crown of thorns, in the governor's palace, the crude horseplay and ill treatment by hardened, brutalised men. The sort of behaviour that has stalked the corridors of army barracks, concentration camps, police stations and prisons the whole world over before and since. Jesus Christ has representatively taken it all evil undiluted. So no wonder an ancient prophecy about him declared that he would be a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. Surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows. And so I say to you with all my heart, let him have your sorrow and your pain. It's part of his high priestly ministry, depicted so graphically by Hunt's robed and bizarrely crowned figure. We thought of the late Queen just now. Having said in that 2011 Christmas broadcast that we need saving, she used that word, she went on to talk of the one God has sent, the one Hunt shows us. She said, God sent into the world a unique person, neither a philosopher nor a general, she could have added politician, couldn't she, but a saviour with the power to forgive. A saviour 
yes, this priestly king before us here. Early on in his ministry, Jesus was met by someone called John, not the same one who's written our verses, another, John the Baptist, who had a light bulb moment in which he called out this. Look, he said, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Jesus died to take away your sin and mine, which means that we can be forgiven. We can have a clean slate in our record book, so to speak. We can be cleansed and restored to fellowship and friendship with God. But we have to pause at this point because in the picture, the door is still closed. You notice that? And why is that? Because there is no handle on the outside. Now that tells me that Jesus will never force his way into anyone's life. He'll never violate our personality or trample on our free will by barging in uninvited. So, as Hunt himself commented, the painting faces us with a tantalising question. <laughs> will that door be opened or not? And if it is, what difference will that make to the state of the house, in inverted commas, inside and around the threshold outside? Well, let me put it this way. The Bible tells us that opening the door to Christ will be to allow him to undertake a radical spring clean of our house, our inner lives. A spring clean which will take a lifetime. It's always a work in progress. But a spring clean which will make us fit for God's presence, both now and when we die, to be fit to be in his heavenly kingdom. The same St John, who's given us our two previous verses, has recorded yet another in his gospel. Speaking of Jesus, John writes this. He came to his own people, that's the Jews of course, but his own rejected him. Yet to all who received him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become the children of God. A child of God, just picking up that last phrase, a child of God, that is what a true Christian is. Someone who has come into a filial relationship with God their creator and heavenly father through Jesus his son. So what differences does this begin to make in a person's life? Well, the answer is huge differences, though sometimes only gradually and often through battles back and forth, ground lost as well as ground gained. But differences like this, deliverance from the chains of guilt, deliverance from fear of death, of history, loss of hope, where is it all going? Lack of purpose, what am I here for? A sense of cosmic alienation, do I count in this vast universe? All deliverance from those things and release into a deep sense of inner peace. Peace with God and peace with oneself. That is why the Christian faith is called the gospel of peace. I remember some years ago talking to a 30-year-old, Alison. She died young, I'm afraid. I asked her, why do you believe Jesus was so much more than just a, a moral teacher? She said, Andrew, he was the son of God, and he's all I have ever wanted to be and couldn't be without him. That was Alison in her 30s. Let me tell you, she would not have said that in her 20s. So what had happened in the interim? Answer, she had heard someone knocking. Jesus knocking on the door of her life, just as in our picture. And she had opened that door to him. So how does Jesus knock? Well, through our conscience, as we hear the Christian story, perhaps even now as you're listening to this. Maybe it's as we see the lives of Christian friends and deep down we envy their faith. 
So it could be, couldn't it, that the light of the world is knocking on your door today? If so, that's great. He knocks and he waits. But he won't wait forever. Do you notice anything about his feet down at the bottom there? Well, they seem to be turning away as if he's ready to leave. And, oh yes, he's called by at dawn at first light. That suggests that this is urgent and important. Towards the end of his earthly ministry, Jesus returned to his claim to be the light with this added warning. He said, walk while you have the light before darkness overtakes you. Put your trust in the light while you have it, so that you may become children of light. Implication, Jesus will not stay around knocking forever. No wonder Hunt himself admitted that his picture was, quotes, not an easy painting to come to terms with. So as we draw to a close, in the context of this picture, I do want to ask all of you now, have you fully opened the door of your heart, the door of your life, to welcome in the light, the King, the Saviour, the High Priest of the world? And if not yet, are you willing and ready to do so? Or if you did once and it's all gone a bit cold and forgotten, would you be willing to do it again? Doesn't matter saying this prayer more than once. I think there are some of you for whom this occasion could and should be a bit of a watershed moment when maybe you just clinch things spiritually by asking Jesus Christ in, just as I did all those years ago. I'd like to show you a prayer based on this text. Here it is. I'm just going to read it very quickly and then I'm going to uh, say it more slowly. I'll explain in just a moment. Thank you, God, for loving me before I ever loved you. Thank you, Jesus, for dying on the cross to take away my sin. Thank you that I can get connected to you now because you're alive today, knocking on my door. I admit that in so many ways I've kept the door of my life closed to you leading me to think, say, and do wrong things. I ask for your complete forgiveness, and I commit myself to you. Help me to submit my life to your teaching and direction from now on. I humbly receive you into my life and ask you to fill me with your Holy Spirit. Amen. Now, what I'm going to do is this. I'm going to say it line by line, quite slowly, and leave a gap between each line for you to echo it silently in your hearts if you wish to do so. So, are you ready? Thank you, God, for loving me before I ever loved you. Thank you, Jesus, for dying on the cross to take away my sin. Thank you that I can get connected to you now because you're alive today, knocking on my door. I admit that in so many ways, I've kept the door of my life closed to you, leading me to think, say, and do wrong things. I ask for your complete forgiveness, and I commit myself to you. Help me to submit my life to your teaching and direction from now on. I humbly receive you into my life and ask you to fill me with your Holy Spirit. Amen.
Well, thank you for staying with us to the end of what's been quite a long talk, really. I've just got one more thing to say. If you said that prayer, perhaps for the first time, or reset it after a, a long, long gap in the wilderness, so to speak, I do hope you'll tell somebody. It's a really good thing to do. It kind of burns your boats, really. It's harder to go backwards if you've told somebody about what you've done. And also, it would be a good thing, please, to get in touch with uh, Roger Carswell and this broadcast. And with that, I'm going to hand back to him because he'll tell you more. Thanks, Catherine. God bless. Andrew, thank you very, very much indeed. That was excellent. I found it fascinating and it was so clear. Uh, really appreciate that. Thank you. Now, look, it is important that if you really put your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ like that and ask him to become your Lord and Saviour, that, as Andrew said, do tell somebody. Um, but look, we we you know, we have connections all over the country. We could link you to a good Bible believing church in your locality. But we'd also love to send you a booklet explaining more about what it means to become a Christian, how to start growing as a Christian and uh, a New Testament. If you'd like, there is a coupon on the real lives uh, dot net um, YouTube channel. You can email us and we'll gladly, gladly get in touch. If any of you wanted to um, send an email to us that we send on to Andrew. Again, I'm sure he wouldn't mind and we'd gladly do that as well. But that that was excellent. I really appreciate it. Now, God willing, next week, uh, so it will be January the 7th, um, we'll be into the new year, of course. So a very happy new year to you all, a very blessed new year to everyone. Um, we're going to be interviewing Mark Mitchell. Um, <laughs> he's an interesting character. He's a car dealer, an extremely successful one. And if you live in the um, northwest or north uh, Wales or the Cheshire area, you'll know of Mitchell's cars. Um, in fact, I'm driving one. So is my wife and uh, two different types. He deals with um, Lexus and I think Mazda, is it, or something? And Skoda. Mm, Skoda. Anyway, uh, but what an interesting character who made a real good stand. He wouldn't open his garages on Sunday, and uh, one of his dealerships was just taken away from him because of that. But God has blessed him. But it's a great story and a great interview. That's next Saturday at eight o'clock on the real lives.net. And we will be continuing, certainly till Easter, uh, with the interviews. But thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you to Andrew. Do get in touch. God bless you. There's a way back to God from the dark paths of sin A door that is open and you may go in An old wooden cross is where you begin When you come as a sinner to Jesus and all that can stop you is your foolish pride Won't you admit that you've cheated and lied But that is the reason the dear Savior died So come as a sinner to Jesus Won't you come as a sinner to Jesus Peace and forgiveness, a satisfied mind, the sum of the treasures of heaven you'll find. So leave what is hateful and hurtful behind, and come as a sinner to Jesus. There's a way back to God from the dark paths of sin the door that is open and you may go in at Calvary's cross is where you begin when you come as a sinner to Jesus won't you come as a sinner to Jesus please come as a sinner to Jesus.